This is The Vault, an underground facility that stores some of the rarest cars. Today we're going to take an in-depth look at Suki's S2000 from Too Fast Too Furious and ask the question, what's under the hood of this thing? And was it actually as fast as its movie portrayal? Suki's S2000 is the highlight for me, but The Vault also has a ton of incredible stories. Everything from Tony Stark's hot rod from the Avengers, all the way to the Pope Mobile. <laughs> so let's go for an in-depth walk throughout The Vault and show you around. Hey, what's going on guys? We are at the Peterson Automotive Museum in the vault with my buddy Michael here. He's gonna take us through a little bit of a tour and can you describe what makes the vault so special? So the vault in the Peterson is a full city block of storage underground. And what really makes it special is that there's no barriers between you and the cars. And the only thing that we really encourage in the vault is stories. So every car has a story and the cars we feature in the vault have those really spectacular stories. So we have about 250 vehicles down here. We actually partnered with Haggerty to bring our preservation standards up in the vault. And this is where it all begins. It begins with uh, the 1903 Cadillac and the 1904 uh, Studebaker carriage. And we like to start here because the transition to automobiles was not a smooth one. Uh, early automobiles took a long time for people to actually acclimate to. One of the first cars that you're kind of walking into, and again, you have a lot of these impromptu stories, is Iron Man's 32 Ford. Uh, this was from Iron Man 1. Uh, when he's working on this car, Jarvis is helping him with the compression. Uh, 32 Ford was the first Ford V8, and that's why it was the hot rod of choice. So behind me is the one and only hardtop convertible Mustang. Here you've got the Rob Beardick uh, Chevy kickflip car. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, right next No to way. The, uh, 83 Celica Supra. You'll see a couple of these around the vault. We're trying to expand the Japanese cars in the Peterson collection. Original owner, 250,000 miles on this car. <laughs> still looks pretty, good. Still looks pretty good. We love to see original owner cars where people have just loved it and that passion kind of passes through to us. So this guy behind me, I gravitated towards because the front grille actually reminded me of an Etzel Ranger. Yeah. And that car was a huge flop. So um, I was curious about this one and thankfully I got a really cool answer. So what's the story of this guy? The interesting story is that this was a family that made aluminum for refrigerators and they wanted to show uh, another purpose for it. So the car has this kind of really cool aluminum skin on it. It's called the Scimitar and the car itself actually has ties to the Recaro family. Really? So there's some really great stories behind this car. Um, and if you want to find out more about it, you can go on our website and there's a full, you know, deep dive on it. So behind me now is the original concept for the FD RX-7, but unfortunately it's just a chassis. So basically it was debuted at the LA Auto Show and it was essentially a concept to show the next RX-7. And you can definitely tell in the front end some of the Miata roots it's got, especially with the flip ups. All right, so the last time I was here, you guys absolutely loved taking a look at Suki's S2000. So this is from Too Fast, Too Furious. And essentially it's the first race of the movie where they jump over the bridge and do all that crazy shenanigans. And of course the pink flames coming out the back, which makes total sense. <laughs> so Michael was kind enough to let me pop the hood of Suki's S2000, which is, probably a pretty rare view. You oh, don't yeah. really get to see it that there's often. There's a reason why. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason why, because the quality of the movie tried to deceive you of how nice the engine bay was. A lot of people might think Suki's S2000 is turbocharged because that's what you had kind of associated with four cylinder imports in the early 2000s especially, but this one has a Paxton centrifugal supercharger on it. And the reason I thought that might be the case is because in I think Forza 6, they had a Fast and Furious pack. And when you upgraded it, you could upgrade the supercharger on it huh. and not the turbo on it. So turbo. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if that's true. I've yeah. always been so curious and it is. Yeah. So let's take a look at the engine bay. So one of my favorite not so good things is the overspray, which shows that a hero car in the movie does one thing. It looks pretty on the outside and it gets the job done. So basically they would use the hero cars as the cars for the main shots, pulling up to the car meets, the glamour shots, and essentially when the characters are standing in front of it. So that's why most of the time this hood is probably closed. And you can see the little like first, yeah. Oh, wow, I, I guessed right. Yeah, first unit, yep. principal car only. 
so they would not use this for stunts or the car jump or anything like that. So here we have the Paxton Centrifugal. It's very similar to anything you would see today on an S2000. It's mounted in the exact same spot that you would today if you were to buy this kit. Along with that, we have the original F-Series engine that's in the S2000, revs to 9,000 RPM. But all in all, it's an S2000 engine. So if you're ever curious what the underside of this thing looked like, that's what it looks like. But if you see the rest of the car, you can tell that this car was thrown together to work. Like it's not one of those things where they're like, oh yeah, we need to have it at a car show. They literally put this kit on. Look, even on the hood, we have the first unit principal car only, supercharged and fuel cell. So it's number nine. So that probably means what, Michael? There's probably nine of these on set? Potentially, maybe 10. You never know. I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to see how many were taken for the jump shot. Oh my God, I can't <laughs> imagine like breaking oil pans and everything else. Oh, when you see this, else. the whole front bumper actually comes off in the shot and then they cut to it and it's dragging, but it actually shot right off when they <laughs> jumped it, so. You'll notice this interior is just outrageous. <laughs> Essentially, you have these fuzzy seats, which Kind of look comfortable, I'm not gonna lie, but ridiculous and I would never want to stain them or anything. The Sparco wheel, you have the notorious NOS buttons. You have the gauges on the dash, which are pretty much stuck on. And the gauges are by Apexi, which is a brand that was very associated with the early 2000s tuner culture. And I definitely have to talk about the screen on the dash, which one, on the movie looks really cool because of the time it was like a cool thing to do to have your laptop in the corner, thus the notorious danger to manifold floorboard but at the same time there's this giant molding on the dash in order to have it hold in place but thankfully this car does have a built motor and is boosted so essentially had the looks of the rest of the cars that weren't fast but this one could actually go places which is nice also a beautiful touch to suki's s2000 is this obnoxious apexi gauge cluster up here that's your tachometer and i'm assuming there's a shift light on it but there's not a lot of the times you could go to AutoZone or advanced auto and get these massive gauges with a shift light on it and it would just blind you every single time you went to shift michael just noticed something that i never noticed is look at the mirror so the mirror has this like cnc yeah. metal object just to hold the mirror down i think the question is is it actually metal just gently the relic of Too Fast, Too Furious. That is definitely metal. This actually looks like one of the universal shift knobs you could buy off of Sparco. But if you notice, <laughs> with the nitrous buttons, they literally printed off into O and stuck them on here. Basically, I'm guessing for camera shots during the shoot to be like, okay, they're pushing the nitrous button. And we gotta show that this is the nitrous button. So just to make it super clear what the objective of these red buttons are. But most of the time, it's probably just a horn. It's a veil side kit. And back in the day, all of the kits were fiberglass. There was pretty much no polyurethane. So you were lucky if you got a good fitted kit, but this is one of the cars in the Fast and Furious franchise that kind of backs up what it was supposed to do. You can notice the, the paint and everything, the livery, that it was very of the time and of course, you can't miss out on the giant wing. So looking at Suki's S2000, there's an element of me that kind of misses the tackiness of the early 2000s with car culture, because think about it, everybody's cars looked completely different and it wasn't just buying the same wheels and slamming it or bagging it or just the same coilovers, et cetera. But at the same time, looking at the car, you can definitely tell it's a dated car but it has a charm to it because it's dated. So if you haven't been to the Peterson, you gotta check out Suzuki's 2000 when they officially reopen. Because unfortunately, I've been very privileged, thanks to this man. Before we leave Suzuki's S2000, let's, I'll just do a quick rundown of the Speed Racer car. And who built the Speed Racer car? Uh, this was done by Gotham Garage, who actually has the Netflix show now, Car Masters. Oh, okay, that makes sense. The fact that a lot of it was a CGI model in the movie too. Yeah. It just, they really did a good job matching the CGI to the live action car. And along with that, if you haven't watched that movie in a while, dude, it's like overwhelming. <laughs> like it's just ridiculously colorful, but. It's like playing Sonic on a PS1. Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> that, but I will say for a first live action kind of speed racer anime attempt, it was pretty neat. Yeah. <laughs> Quick shout out to Donut Media. This is the, basically the cheap car and the more expensive car series they did with the 350Zs. 
and actually looked pretty good. Good job, guys. Austin Power Shagmobile. Oh, this is Austin Power's car. And this was the funny thing is this was actually supposed to be a VW Bug convertible. They pushed the, the release back, and mm -hmm. so Austin Power's production crew just chopped the top on a regular Beetle. Did they really? And made a custom uh, convertible. And they just made it work. Yeah. Uh, you've got the Magnum PI for your weight, Tom Selleck car, Die Another Day, Jaguar XKR. Oh my Box. god, I forgot about this thing. We've got the Little Miss Sunshine VW bus, and that's got a brand new clutch in it. So I love the mini gun on the back of that. <laughs> you've got the Herbie fully loaded. Uh, this is the Lindsay Lohan Herbie, and this one is actually certified by NASCAR. Top speed about 140 miles Is it really? Uh, you know, again, full, full wrist spread uh, engine. Thelma and Louise Thunderbird. And then you have uh, Stephen King's uh, Plymouth Fury from Christine. This was Evil Knievel's Stutz Italia. Uh, the Stutz Italia was the most expensive American-made car at the time. Uh, Evil Knievel had actually purchased it from Wayne Newton, who got it as a gift from Elvis Presley. Michael, this is by far one of, if not my favorite car down here, other than Suki's S2000, just for the sheer size of it. Yeah, so this is 21 feet long. This is a one of one. It's the, what we call the round door Rolls Royce. Uh, it's really a 25 Phantom One. Uh, we call it the 2534 because it was rebodied in 34. And this car is always associated with the Peterson. There's a big picture of Robert E. Peterson and Margie Peterson on the wall there. And they restored this back to what they believed was its original condition. The original car in 25 was shipped to India. Uh, and then he had it rebodied in 1934 in Belgium by the coach builder Jacques Heer. Uh, and that's where you get this beautiful 20, you know, 20, 21 foot body. Uh, it still is a Phantom One motor, which at its prime was about 100 horsepower. And the car weighs just about 6,000 pounds. So it's never going to get out of its own weight. You know, Rolls Royce didn't actually make bodies. So when you bought a Rolls, you actually got the chassis and the powertrain. Oh, okay. You always had to take it to a coach builder. I did not know that. It's got an almost Batmobile feel. It is. Yeah, a it's Corella got Deville huge, kind of thing. 18 you know? inch fin on the back. You know, for aerodynamics, again, you know, not, not really needed. Um, but uh, I think the cool thing is that this car, you know, its story is really unique. At one point, it was painted white and was in a Japanese showroom, Rolls Royce showroom. At another time, an American entrepreneur named Max Obi had it painted with real gold flake Ooh. and toured around the United States, similar to like a, a circus. Uh, you charge a dollar for people to take their picture with it. Uh, and then it ended up in a New Jersey junkyard, at, and that's where you know it was purchased and, and restored. So what a journey! Yeah, like wow. So it's a reverse hinge. So you come around this way, uh, and you can actually see. You know, this is our deco. So you know, windows open out. It's, everything that's meant to be functional is also meant to kind of be art, right? Uh, you just you know you get a good grab on it, and it weighs probably you know, 20, 30 pounds. It's, I saw you bracing thing. yourself yeah. for a second. <laughs> so you know you had fitted luggage back in this time. Two unique cars, AKA the good and evil of the yeah. Peterson Auto Museum. We have the Pope Mobile. Yeah, this is Pope John Paul II's Pope Mobile. Uh, never actually rode in the car, it doesn't have the protection. Sure. Uh, but it is blessed, so it's considered a relic. Okay. And then you have uh, Saddam Hussein's Mercedes 600 Land Delay Pullman. So, was that retrieved in like 03 or 04, do you that think? That was early, yeah. So, what happened was, is Bob Peterson wanted a Land Delay. You know, those were the most luxurious uh, cars that were on the road, They're the cars of royalty. And the story uh, that I have heard on this car, and don't quote me on it, is that at one point, a soldier, you know, during one of the raids, drove this over the Jordan border, uh, sold it, it was auctioned off, ended up in another auction, and that's where we acquired it. Wow. We didn't know, or Bob Peterson didn't know the ownership until the curatorial team started digging into it. Holy cow. Oh so my there's God. still like speechless water bottles and sand and stuff in the trunk. That oh, you just left it in there? Yeah. yeah. You gotta leave it in there. Yeah. I came here last time seeing this car and you almost get this almost like sense of dread around it. Oh yeah, and it has bad juju. You know what's funny though, about four years ago, I did a beater car road trip with some friends. Yeah. And I bought one of these limos for 800 bucks. Oh wow. Yeah, and just drove it all the way down to Miami. And it worked. <laughs> and it worked. I think of it. Oh, okay. Okay, you're good. Then quickly touching base on these, this is a Soviet Union era car. This is a Chaika, uh, and it's next to the Hung Chi. So this is kind of our row of presidential diplomatic cars. These cars are still in production today, and they look pretty much the same. Really? I did not know that. Yeah. 
Hongji and, 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 and Chaika, again, if you look at them, you know, some of the interior components have been modernized, the engines have been slightly modernized, but they look kind of the same today. Um, which is interesting, you know, it's just one of those kinds That they of just things. never like expanded. Yeah. Like, and those two lights on the back are actually airplane landing lights. Oh, on this Mercedes, yeah. okay. And so you blind them with the light, you hit them with the smoke, and then you hit them with the oil, oh and you God. can evade them. Again, you know, fully armor plated as well. Uh, you know, President of the Philippines. It's very country. deceiving. Yeah. You would have no idea. Until you're slipping off the side of the road. Well, I think what really is impressive is the glass. Yeah. Because it's probably like this thick, but they did it in a way to where it's, if kind you just- Kind of integrated, yeah. Yeah, if you just drove on by, you would have no idea. Definitely, you can tell, you know, the little latches, you know, these kinds of things. Let's see if it is. You can feel that the weight of the door, you know, they put lead inside the door. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. It does not open like a normal Mercedes no. door. Oh yeah, because to push it back, Correct. that's yeah. where it really comes into play. Interesting. So this was President Eisenhower's Chrysler Parade Phaeton. Uh, you know, this is a parade car, so you can see the additional uh, you know, space in the back. This car was also used later for the Apollo missions when the astronauts would come back in parades. Oh really, so they'd come back and put them in here. Exactly, yeah. So in this one, we actually still use for parades. You know, it's been over-engineered, more cooling, which is okay. perfect for, you know. So it's not sending in traffic overheating. Exactly. Going with the World War II theme. Yeah. And also, you know, that's 59, but World War II famous people FDR's car. Yeah, so this was actually the first uh, commissioned by the fact, uh, you know, by, for a president uh, production armor plated vehicle. So it, it was a FDR, you can see the extra space in the back at that time, you needed the extra space to get in and out. And then also you can see it's seven layers of laminated glass, lead doors. Uh, this is based on a Lincoln Zephyr, but it weighs just over 8,000 pounds. <sighs> the shields, what they do is they actually cover the gap of the window because when the windows roll down, it's so, Thick. So, first Honda ever imported into the United States. Yeah, so this is the N668. Uh, the interesting story on this is that this was a original owner car. He didn't know he had the first Honda. No way. Honda did a great piece on this. Uh, the car was taken to an N600 restorer, and when they pulled the radiator out, he saw the serial number, which was 001. Wow. And so we were very lucky to work with Honda. They've you know, allowed us to display this car. And the funny thing is, is it looks really tiny, but if you get inside, it's extremely spacious. It's kind of like a classic Mini is. Exactly. It's deceiving. Yeah. Oh, it has a nice satisfying pop yeah. to it. All right, so for all my Mitsubishi guys, I totally, totally forgot that they made a 3000 GT Spider. I mean, I think they only made what, like 500 of them or something? Lesser, yeah, yeah, it's a six speed VR4 folding hardtop. And this is actually one of the first electric folding hardtops in like 40 years. Like a previous production car did not have electric folding hardtops. And the fact that the VR4 did that was extremely innovative for the time. The next one after this was the Mercedes and the Lexus SC430, and those two really got the credit. This kind of flew under the radar and nobody really remembers well, it. Well, same with its active aero and oh, four-way yeah. steering. It had all these really yeah. interesting pieces of technology that were just too ahead of its time. Yeah, the four-wheel steering is interesting because this, like the 300ZX, I forgot what it's called on this, but it was called Heikas on the 300s. Heikas uh, differential. Yeah. yeah. And it, yeah, turning a little bit on, I think it was speeds under like 50 miles an hour to give you that much better, you know, uh, yeah, now Porsche does it in other cars, pretty much. And a lot of supercars do. I think the Rimac is doing it. So it, it's something that, again, ahead of its time. And it wouldn't be, you know, uh, proper without, you know, a different head unit in it. You know, all of these cars had modified head units. This one is no different. All right, so, Michael, I got to ask. Yeah. How come VW hasn't made cool stuff like this recently? <laughs> uh, I think the cost, unfortunately. I mean, this car was a, a really special project. It was a Piac Porsche challenging Volkswagen to build a super efficient car. Uh, that was called the one liter project. Uh, that one liter project turned into the XL project. Uh, and then this is the XL Sport, the, the final iteration. The whole challenge was uh, to originally build a car that could go 100 miles on one liter of gas. Uh, and to do efficiency, they did a lot of things like narrowing the cabin for aerodynamics. And this one actually uses the engine out of a Ducati because motorcycle engines are extremely efficient. But it's a really cool design. You're never gonna see one of these on the road. This is the first time that it's actually in the United States. I have to mention, it's kind of hard to see, but the seats are staggered. So the driver's seat is forward compared to the passenger seat. 
Definitely. And I think one of the, the, this pulls from the Type 64. So in 1939, the Type 64 Porsche had the same thing. Aerodynamics, narrowed cabin. You didn't want to rub shoulders with your passenger. I'm not going to talk too much about this one, but in a nutshell, first Ferrari ever. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's all you need to know. Yeah, 1947 125S, most valuable car down in here right now. Still to this day, the smallest displacement V12 engine. What's the displacement on it? Uh, it's 1.5 liters. What? Yeah. For so, a V12? For a V12. So, you know, each piston is about the size of a tablespoon. Wow. So, I think Marty McFly is riding in style with so, this thing. So, this is really interesting. So, you know, what makes the DeLorean unique is its stainless steel skin. And American Express took advantage of that. So, uh, when they came out with their Christmas catalog, for $85,000, you could buy a real 24 pull plated uh, DeLorean like this. They were supposed to make 14 of them. They ended up only making three. This one was in a Texas bank showroom to promote the card. It's only got 15 miles on the clock. So it's ba basically a time capsule, no pun intended. Uh, and it's a car that fluctuates with the value of gold. You know, it's fully gold plated, so. That is such an odd, yeah. like, way to value a car. Exactly. <laughs> so here we have this beautiful Bugatti. From what year? This is a 39. Uh, this is the Shah of Iran's Bugatti. This was a one of one. This was a, a wedding gift by the French government to the Prince of Persia. And at the same time, the Americans gave him an uh, Airstream and the British gave him a tea set. So if you're trying to win uh, a country over, this is the gift you give them. Exactly, a Bugatti. A Bugatti. Uh, and this has the diplomatic windshield, so you can actually roll it up and down. So if you were parading through town, your picture would not be obstructed. Just a stunning car. 1979, this car did trade hands for under $300. And now its value is well into the eight figures. So it's, it's got some amazing lineage to it. It's this beautiful blue. We actually had it on the lawn at Pebble uh, back in 2016. I just can't believe that the person just didn't know what they had when exactly. they sold it. Like, yeah. I cannot believe that. I saw this and Michael was like, we got to talk about this because yeah. it's this weird, strange three-wheeled vehicle. From what year about? This is 48. Okay. Uh, so same year as the Tucker. And a similar story. It was an entrepreneur, uh, Gary Davis, who was trying to create his own car company. Unfortunately, you know, he was not successful. He went bankrupt. 16 of these were made. Uh, some, there is some, I would say, celebrity ownership in that Wayne Carini has another one. He actually brought it to uh, Lemons to display it one oh, year. Oh, no way. It widens in the center. There's only one long bench seat. It's got this space age kind of feel to it exactly. for the time. Removable hard top. It's got a Hercules motor in it. So I was going to ask, does this have stability yep. problems? So if you just you know lightly tap it, you can see that it, it is not the most stable car. <laughs> I couldn't imagine him like a pothole in this yes. thing. Just like doing this number. We did, we did a crowdfunding campaign uh, back in 2015 on this car, so we actually restored it to its original condition. Wow. Which is really cool. Matt Ferris Countach is here, which yeah. is amazing. Matt, you really know how to pick them because this thing is beautiful. At the same time, I just want to give a huge thanks to Peterson and also Michael for giving me a private tour of this place and how can they find you guys? Absolutely. So we are on YouTube as well. Uh, the handle is Peterson Museum. We publish every Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. And you get to see the cars and we go out to other collections. Awesome. Well, there you go. If you like cool stories, cool collections, make sure to go check out Peterson Museum. They're great people, incredibly knowledgeable, and I will always come back to Peterson to see more cars. So thank you so, thank much. You so much. I appreciate it. I upload every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday, and I'll see you guys next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. This video is brought to you by Patterson Car Care. Get double of premium original detail product for half the price. Head over to PattersonCarCare.com or go to the link in the description below.